Lord. It's good to be here again this morning and be able to open up God's Word, to worship the Lord together, and to hear us share our gifts with each other. Ladies, that was truly beautiful. I just didn't know I was supposed to wear a red belt today in black. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Uh, we've been working our way through the Acts of the Apostles, and I, I thought we'd read that uh, first bit there of the Acts from chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, because there in that portion of Scripture is really the thesis of the whole of the Acts of the Apostles. It's about being witnesses to what Christ has done. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit so that we might give witness and give testimony as Paul has here in front of King Agrippa these last few weeks as we've looked at Acts chapter 26. And I spoke last week, and I think as I focused, really we know that uh, Paul is standing before King Agrippa. He's giving testimony. He's giving witness to the hope that's within him. But within there is him sharing his own personal testimony of what God has done in his life. So we delved quite deeply into the fact that God is absolutely sovereign in the salvation of those that will come to him. That when God saves those he calls, he changes them radically and transforms them from being completely adverse to God, being completely in dark, being in the kingdom of Satan, and, 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 and contrary to everything that God has. But by God's sovereignty, he so changes the heart of those that he changes that they are 100% different. It talks about repentance, that 180 degree U-turn from headed one way to headed to another way. And if you can look at it and think about it, as, as, as Paul said, it's about being translated from the power of Satan to the power of God. And that's what that portion was there that we read about that infilling. And I talked last week, we talked about disgusting worm-like caterpillars, larvae, eating themselves alive in this transformation into the beautiful butterfly. And, and with God at work sovereignly in that, as sure as it started, he's going to bring it to completion, right? Amen? So what I want to remind us, though, is that when we look at all of Scripture, we learned this morning, not one jot, not one tittle will pass till all is fulfilled, till God brings about all of his good purposes in creation. But we have got to go back to creation. Even we've talked about going back to before creation, to understand that God has written a grand story of which we are players and he himself becomes a player. In this overall story, if we're going to understand scripture, we need to understand, and I said it a few weeks ago, that there are four acts to this story. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And even in that story, it's an incredible story of transformation. It's a story of a good creation. Everything created good. Man created in God's wonderful image <clears throat> and given a, uh, a commission, a commission to subdue the earth, take dominion, uh, to, to, to have vocations, to work, and to somehow display the glory of God to the world. And take that garden and spread it throughout the whole world, as it were. Of course, that's derailed because of the fall. But as, I, as we talked about a few weeks ago, is the beginning of when Paul starts to speak. And have your Bibles open there to chapter 26 of the Acts of the Apostles. Paul talks about the hope of the promises made to the fathers. A sure hope that is surely going to come to pass. And in that sure hope are, tr are, are tremendous scriptures that speak about things that are going to come and things that are not yet fulfilled, that are still working themselves out in time and in space. That very text that Stan read this morning, that very familiar Christmas text, is still in progression, is still in the work of transformation. God is transforming the world 
by the power of the gospel, one person, one family, one nation at a time. And that power of the gospel is such to so change people that it also changes culture in turn. And what might be more amazing, that God has chosen to use those that believe to carry that message forward, that incredible message of transformation. So listen, you look at history, and you look back at history, and I think if any of us do, we notice that it's a mess. It's a mess. It, like, I can't make heads or tails of it at times. I just got done with church history too, and it's an absolute disaster. <laughs> things that are going on. Even guys that are men of God that I so loved, and I look back and I see them making mistakes along the way. I see them struggling. Jonathan Edwards is one of my heroes, and he made some mistakes and ended up losing his pastorate. How does that happen? I see Jonathan Edwards, he had a perspective on what he thought was going to be a golden age, that through that uh, awakenings, he thought was going to happen in his life. And I think he misread scripture in that area. I think there is transformation, but it happens throughout all of history. He misinterpreted it for being right then. So what am I saying? I could talk more about history, and I think we will next week, because next week we're going to talk about truth and reason. And we're going to look at how history trans transfers down the ages from the Reformation to the Enlightenment, which was really a new Dark Ages. But we'll talk about that. But I say that about history to say this. History is broken and crooked, but the God of his story is over and behind it. He's bringing to pass his purposes despite us, despite our shortcomings, despite our struggles. So I want to see that God is sovereign in the salvation of individuals, but God is sovereign over all of time bringing his purposes to pass in space and in time. Amen. He alone brings meaning to life. What is the meaning of life? Everybody wants to know, what is the meaning of life? It's very simple. <laughs> it's all in here in four acts. And it's very clear, and it's very systematic, and it very much works itself out over time and space. So we can't be discouraged, but we have to recognize the progressiveness of history. We have to then recognize our part in history and what has God called for us to be and to do. And not just that, we can see in that book things that God is still doing. And then we can have assurance and confidence. You know, I first preached uh, Isaiah chapter 9, those verses that Stan read through uh, an Advent season, I believe, just last year, when we find our country in turmoil, just after or just before the election, I think back in just after, right? Yeah, I think just after. And, and like, oh my goodness, the sky is falling, chicken little, right? We don't have to worry about the sky falling. We don't have to worry about history spinning out of control. It's not going to. God has a plan and a purpose for history that he is progressively bringing apart and working to bring into being. You know, sometimes I get a little bit discouraged about, I think part of our trouble as I've looked through history is that we as the church have misunderstood scripture and pulled ourselves out of action. We've and or misunderstood God's call to the church and that we just kind of settle up in our churches in this pietistic cocoon and we don't carry the message of the gospel to the world. We don't carry out his call for transformation and our part in playing in it. Listen, I want the Lord to come back again, and I look forward to it. But that won't happen until his purposes come to pass. That won't happen until all he has planned occurs, just like what happens to the individual believer. Every good thing he has planned for the individual believer will come to pass. You can count on it the perseverance of the saints will occur. And everything God promises in his word will come to, come to pass. Doug Wilson talks about the state of Christians in, in this kind of pulling back type state. The person who locates all transformation outside of time and history 
really has learned how to use the Christian faith within the boundaries contained by Marx's taunt as the opiate of the masses. By and by, in the sky, when we die, good things will happen. We gave it a big name to console ourselves, mixed in a little already but not yet, and blam, we were good to go. In this instance, going means sitting here and maybe taking some seminary classes. Do you know this book is a book of action? This is a book that calls for us to be something and to do something with what he's done within us. There are precious promises we must carry out, and we can't lay back until it's all accomplished. Listen, there will be a time to rest and to have eternity with God, but we've got to understand the four different uh, uh, scenes that are going on, the four different creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, and all that he calls to action will occur. Relationship between the church's mission uh, to, to the world is such that it's not just a mission to change individuals, but it's a mission to change the world. Isn't that what it says there in Acts? That you might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus said that all authority has been given unto me, therefore go into all the earth, all authority in heaven and earth, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and so on and so forth, and that he is with us till the end. The relationship between church's mission and, and, and a society is the idea of religion is like cultus. That word cultus, you hear culture on that. What people believe will create the kind of culture they live in. What we're seeing now in our culture is an anti-God, man-centered humanism that has tossed God out the window. They have no uh, uh, foundation in scripture. They've thrown away all of the creational norms. And listen, that's not going to go. That's going to end up in either judgment or complete destruction. But we as Christians, as we live out our religion, should be making a difference in the world. And I think that's exactly what we see here in Acts chapter 26. And if you have your Bibles open, we're going to be working our way through 26, 16 to 18. That's really what we've gone over the last couple of weeks. But, but I saw it as the individual, personal, uh, sovereign change in, the, in people that are believers, which it's true. But what Jesus has called Paul to, what he called those first apostles to, and what he in turn calls the believer to, is to bring a gospel of change to the world. That same radical transformation you've seen in yourself, carry that to the world. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom now I send you. To do what? To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of darkness to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Saul, you have been radically transformed into Paul. And listen, those first apostles in Acts chapter 1 and Paul, they're different from us. They saw the resurrected Lord Jesus. But they're no different in the fact that they were radically transformed. And we are called to, in that radical transformation, to bring this message. That part there in verse 18 and following, called to go to the Gentiles, to go to the Jews, to go to the world, really carrying out the Great Commission to open eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is simply that radical transformation, transforming, pe transforming people and transforming the world. So again, we've not been given so that we might just hang on to these things. You know, God doesn't save people so we could sit in our holy cocoon and, and sing kumbaya together and hold hands and think about how wonderful God is, although he is wonderful. And it is good to hold hands and to worship God together. But we are called to bring a message to the world. 
We're called to be transformative in the hand of God under the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I want to see, see three points as we walk through here. Obedient to go transform, gospel of transformation, and the Lord of transformation and life. So again, keep your Bibles open there in verse 19 and 23. Paul has laid out everything for King Agrippa. And then he makes it clear, King Agrippa, I didn't go home to Tarsus. I didn't rest on my laurels. I didn't sing a happiness to God because of what he did. I was obedient to that heavenly vision. But declared first to those in Damascus, in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. Don't you see that's the very same thing that, 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 that Christ called those apostles to do? To carry a message to the world? Paul does that very thing. The moment he's been transformed by the power of God, he's been given a mission. The mission of God to the lost. Those in Damascus, those in Jerusalem, those in the region of Judea. Basically, he could have said, I've sent you, Paul, to the whole wide world. I think somewhere in Romans, Paul even says, I've carried this message to the world. And it's the very same message we're called to do. Paul here is demonstrating how it's done. He's been radically transformed. He obediently goes forth. So what happens to the believer who's been radically transformed? We must go forth. We must go forth with this radical message of transformation. I talked a couple weeks ago about it being that pyramid scheme that if you've enjoyed this product so much, you're going to want to share it with others. Well, listen, this is infinitely better being transformed and saved, but now called to bring this message to a lost and dying world. And, and you notice just quickly within that portion we talked about is the idea of kingdom. The, if you look at all of the Bible, you can relate it to kingdom. I've said it many times, little kings and queens in the garden called to be uh, 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 vice regents of God to carry forth that kingdom. They were put in a kingdom, they started the garden, they were called to carry that kingdom to the world. It was broken at the time, but this has been reestablished. If you look at Acts, if you go back, you still got Acts open, just quickly, <clears throat> this, what he had, Theophilus uh, had been given through Luke here. It says in verse two, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering. Pretty much exactly what Jesus did to Paul as well. Presented himself alive to, to, to Saul and, and to Paul and sends him off these infallible truths being seen by them during 40 days. And what was Jesus speaking to them? Speaking to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then going further in verses, what would end up happening there is they didn't completely understand what Jesus was talking about. What is this kingdom of God, and how does it relate to them? Are you going to restore Jesus, the kingdom, to Israel right now? They thought maybe Jesus was going to set up his earthly rule right there, and Israel was going to rule the world, and that was going to be the kingdom of God. The reason Jesus didn't go into depth, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't fully understand or grasp the length and the depth and the height and how far this kingdom was going to extend, that it was going to go to all the world. So that's where they misunderstood. And Jesus, Jesus putting them back on task says, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has in his own authority. Then he sends them out to the world. Because the times and the seasons of this transformation are working themselves out throughout space and time and history. As sure as you've been saved and you shall be sanctified and glorified, so God is bringing forth his purposes. The Gentiles were the sworn enemies, I want to recognize too, of the Jews. And where does Paul go? He's been sent to the Gentiles. And what's interesting when you think about that, it's such a neat thing that the Lord would do. He would choose Paul, who was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, who had the very feelings of those Jews that wanted to kill him. He had no love loss for Gentiles. He had no love at all for Gentiles. 
But you see, the power of the transformation of the Holy Spirit in the kingdom has given him now a love. Now, if I got saved like that, I don't think that I'd want to go to those folks. There's such a hatred. But you see, when you're touched by love and you're changed by love, you care for the ones you actually at one point hated. Well, not just that, but Jesus sends him to those who are trying to kill him. And that is a real illustration for us, too. That even though he was beaten, even though he was thrown in jail, even though he was stoned to the point of death, he is carrying the gospel to them over and over and over. Remember what Paul, saw Paul would do. It didn't matter what danger he was in. So folks, for us, we're called to be those type of missionaries. We're called to go share the love of Christ with family, friends, and neighbors. We're called to care for them and bring this gospel of love and of change. That's what we looked at well, a couple weeks ago when we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Those that have been com were compelled, what? Compelled by the love of Christ to go forth to preach as new creations, to reconcile, to, to be ambassadors for Christ. Those that have been radically transformed are sent to be those that will radically transform the world. And it starts with our very neighbors, our very friends, our very family. John Stott says it this way, the cross of Christ, in his book, The Cross of Christ, if you haven't read it, it's wonderful. If the cross is to mark our Christian life in the home and the church, this should be even more so in the world. The church tends to become very preoccupied with its own affairs, obsessed with petty parochial trivia, while the needy world outside is waiting. So the Son sends us out into the world as the Father had sent him into the world. Mission arises from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His birth, by which he identified himself with our humanity, calls us to a similar, costly identification with people. His death reminds us that suffering is the key to the church growth, since it is the seed that dies which multiplies. And his resurrection gave him the universal lordship that enabled him both to claim that all authority was now his and to send his church to disciple the nations. That's very simply the Great Commission. It's a, it's a, it's a message of change. It's not a message where we just kind of sit here in church and go, man, the world's going kind of tough. I think I'm going to pull back a little bit. You know, maybe Jesus will come this week. I won't have to do nothing. <coughs> well, if he comes, praise the Lord. But we need to be about our Lord's business in the meantime. We need to be preaching and loving our enemies and bringing this very message. Stock goes on to say generosity is indispensable to the followers of Christ. Does generosity mark our lives as it should? There was an almost reckless extravagance about Christ's love on the cross. It challenges the calculating coldness of our love. Translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love. It's got to mark our lives as we go forward. So that, of course, is first and foremost, point one there, that we are called to obediently go in order that we might transform. Gospel of transformation. Now, what's the message we're going to bring? What do we tell people? We don't have to wonder what Christ calls us to do in witnessing and in the mission of God to this lost and dying world. Verse 20, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. The very thing that, should, that happened in Saul's life, he had repented and turned from his sin. He was translated and turning from that sin, turning to God, from Satan to God. And then what is sanctification? It's doing works befitting re uh, repentance. We're calling folks to change. Recognize throughout all of this, it says that they, that they. There is a focus on those folks that we're going to and what we're carrying to them, that they might repent, turn to God, do works befitting repentance, that they might be transformed by the same radical message that
that changed them, Paul, and that changed us. He preached that they must repent as he had when he had turned, that they must take that moral U-turn, that God will so transform them as he has transformed him. The problem with this is, this isn't easy. If you read a book about winning friends and gaining company, it's not going to be when you go see your neighbor and go, hey, how's it going? Listen, we've had times where we've talked here together, but, but you know what? You need to repent and turn to Christ. You, you need to stop living with your girlfriend, and you need to come to Christ. Telling people to repent, we need to bring hard words in a, in a world that we're told to listen. Keep that stuff to yourself. It's none of your business what I'm doing, neighbor. And the same thing within our own families. We've got family that are lost in sin. Who knows our family better than us? But who's going to tell them than us that have been transformed by the gospel so that we know what sin is wrong, that we can carry that message to our family, to our neighbors? Preaching repentance is very difficult. They're sinners in need of a Savior, but we must, if we really love them, tell them to turn. It's really true. If they don't turn, they'll end up dying in that sin. And if they die in that sin, they will end up separated from God for eternity. We shouldn't fear man, but we should fear him who's able to send us both body and soul into hell. That's who we must fear, and that's who we preach the others to fear and to trust. Verse 20, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. No, 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 James, it's much easier just to live and let live. It's much easier, you know what, just to hang out with all of us folks that know the Lord. And, and listen, God will, God will get a hold of them. He'll do that work. He's big enough. He's sovereign. I remember the story of that one missionary who was uh, William Carey when he went before the, the missions board and, and, and he had such a heart for the lost. And they told him, young man, sit down. God will save the heathen when he's good and ready. God doesn't save the heathen apart from us who've been changed going forth in, in God's hands bringing this message of love. It's what has to happen. And this is how God causes his grace to abound. I just love it. I quoted it, and I'll quote um, um, Van Til again, but Romans 5, 20 to 21 is so wonderful. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in, uh, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, sin reigned in our lives, but grace much more. Sin is wreaking havoc in people's lives and in this culture and in this world and in the nations of this world. Sin is, but grace is the power of the much more of transformation that God can do. How far has sin marred creation? How far has sin abounded? that much more grace would abound. Is that not what Scripture says there? Do we believe what Scripture says? Sin causes all to fall into despair and death, and, uh, but the sweep of grace is infinitely greater and spreads into all points of the world. Again, what I tried to say there at the beginning, that religion is just culture lived out. Okay? And we see the culture of this, the religion of this culture being played out what I'm saying, though, is that if we can meet it with the power of the gospel, God will change people. That person that's lost and dead in sin, all of a sudden, they're changed. Instead of living in the sin, that, that, that sin that's destroying them, that's destroying their family, that's destroying everything, all of a sudden, now they're changed. They're translated, and now we can see the grace of God going forward. What I want to see, and where this comes from, this idea of, of the gospel being practical, the gospel being applicable, it goes back to the Reformation, and it really goes back to John Kelvin, who had the idea that this gospel would change the world. 
I don't know where he got that. Well, it's all over the New Testament that this gospel would change the world. All authority, therefore, go. Van Til says this, How far is sin marred creation? I guess I already started quoting him there. How far is sin abounded from individuals to families to nations and to all parts of culture? Sin causes all to fall into despair and death. But the sweep of grace is infinitely greater and spreads into all points of culture. As a matter of fact, cultures are a response to the religious beliefs of the people worked out in all of life. Culture is lived religion. It is the form that religion takes in the lives of men. It's not a matter of who is going to rule and reign in a society. It's not a matter of what the church tries to tell us. Now listen, we live in a pluralistic society. We need to back up and let the uh, Muslim have their part, let the humanist have their part. We just want to have a little, a little space at the table. That's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that Jesus alone is Lord. The gospel says that you're in sin and you must repent and turn to God through faith in Christ. That's what the gospel calls for. The gospel calls for calling people to repentance. The church is the vehicle of the prophetic voice to a lost world. Now, maybe a miracle will never turn, but at the very least, they're going to be judged and swept away. And God will raise up a righteous standard. What I would hope, what John Calvin hoped, what Van Til says here, what I think scripture teaches is that there is a way in which the world can be changed through the power of the gospel. That, that as Van Til says, the sweep of redemption is as comprehensive as the sweep of sin. Where sin increased, as I've quoted Romans 5.20, grace abounded all the more. But where does sin increase? I think we can see it. It begins in the human heart, but it moves outward to culture, to art, to education, science, music, architecture, technology, economic, economics, and politics. The gospel is about incrementally getting rid of sin, including cultural sin, because each of these spheres and all others have been corrupted by sin. To confess Christ as Savior from sin, but to deny his relevance and power in the realm of culture is to deny his kingship over the believer in the world. Does that make sense? Is the gospel powerful enough to change a man? It changed me. Yes. I used to be a druggie on my way to hell. But God touched me by his Holy Spirit, opened my heart, and changed my whole direction in life. He can do that on a grand scale. At least that's what it seems that the New Testament is promising here. Those who repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. People, families, nations, cultures will be radically transformed. That's when we look at those promises. The beginning of peace and justice from that time forward and forevermore. Speaking of the time of Christ. But we discount it. We look at history as so broken and bent that it can never be turned. You might not be a Christian rightly. See, our God knows how to get up out of the grave. He knows how to turn people around. The message of the gospel of transformation will have an incredible impact if we tell them. If we don't tell them, someone else will. For these reasons, then, Paul goes on to say in verse 21, the Jews seized me, and in the temple they tried to kill me. Because Paul had told them to repent and turn to God. He had told them that Jesus was the Messiah you're looking for. You need to trust him. When you bring the message of the gospel, they're not going to necessarily welcome you with big smiling faces. They might come after you and try to kill you. They might want to, the Lord knows what. They've killed Christians over the centuries for doing just that. But should that shut us up? Of course not. Paul didn't go back to Tarsus and settle into a nice academic scholarship of a life, building beautiful tents and opening a, an outdoorsman store there in Tarsus. He carried the message of the gospel to a world that was adverse to him, that was against him. 
Verse 22, therefore having obtained help from God. Do you see, folks, Paul was a co-laborer with God. We are co-laborers with God. We can be quiet, we can stay in our homes, or we can be obedient to the heavenly vision. We can be obedient to what God has called us to. The Lord, Paul was told in a dream, stood by him and said, Be of good courage, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness to me at Rome. You know that little Paul standing there in that grand auditorium, standing before a king who could say off with his head in a moment, with a governor that could give him over to the Jews to kill him, Paul did not shrink back. And it's not because Paul was some great power. It's because God stood to near Paul. It's because Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Because God was working with and through Paul. We've got to be a company of people that are courageous in the face of rejection and opposition. It's easy to shrink back from opposition. It's easy to shrink back when we're rejected. You know what? I'm sorry I didn't said that. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You know what? God loves you. Everything will be fine. No. we got to say the hard things. They're going to put us in opposition. Every, I don't know if you've ever read J.I. Packer, Knowing God. J.I. Packer is a wonderful writer. He's written a lot on the Puritans. This idea that I'm bringing out to you about being active in the world and applying the gospel to all areas of life is no new thing. This comes down from scripture to Calvin and to the Puritans. And J.I. Packer put it this way, the Puritans exemplified maturity. We don't. Spiritual warfare made the Puritans what they were. They accepted co conflict as their calling, seeing themselves as the Lord's soldier pilgrims, not expecting to be able to advance a single step without oppos opposition of one sort or another. That's what the Puritans were like. That's what the godly Christian should be like. That's what we all should be like under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, courageous, carrying out the message to the world. Today, however, Christians in the West are found to be on the whole passionless, passive, and one fears prayerless, cultivating an ethos that encloses personal piety in a pietistic cocoon. He even used my cocoon. They leave public affairs to go their own way and neither expect nor, for the most part, seek influence beyond their own Christian circle. Does that not sound like the church today? Does that not maybe sound like the church the last hundred years? Could we maybe be in this desperate state because the church has been cowards and have not been embracing all that God has for them? We can learn a lot from the Puritans. But the Puritans labored for a holy England and New England, sensing that where privilege is neglected and unfaith uh, excuse me, sensing that where privilege is neglected and unfaithfulness reigns, national judgment threatens. This is what the Puritans believed in standing for truth uncompromisingly. I'm not asking us to go back to some, some golden age where America is the savior of the world. America has never been and never will be the savior of the world. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of the gospel preached that has the power to change. We did have a time in our country where we did have an influence of the Christian Western culture. That's gone. Maybe for some of those reasons I've said. But it doesn't mean it's gone forever. May we be part of that new humanity who's been so changed by the power of the gospel that we carry it to this world. Are we the prayerless ones that don't expect that there's any hope in the world? Or can we be like those that are just biblical folks? God said it, that settles it, I'll do it. You know what, though? The world might hate us. There might be a cost. Boys, be quiet. If the 
world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's okay. You know what? If things are going good and the world's digging you, we might be, might be able to need time to change and do what God calls us to. We need a lost and, and, and a world that's serving Satan to hate us because we're standing for truth. We're preaching the gospel. So what does Paul say as he goes further in verse 22? To this day I stand. I just hear uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and so on and so forth. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spirits in high places. Guess what? All of them are subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To this day I stand witnessing both to small and great. God does not show partiality. God calls us to witness to the poor. He calls us to witness to the great, to the rich. He calls us to witness to everybody. You know what? There's that nice family that's, they're lost, but they're, they're kind of, they're at least, they have a nice home. They keep their home nice. They, they drive nice cars. They don't, I'm going to go to them. I'm going to share the gospel with those folks. I'll, I'll go to those folks. But, but those other folks, the, the small, the, those that are, are, are really in sin, that their sin is just bleeding out all over their lives, you know, that they're, they're completely unkempt. They're, they're, you know, they might have piercings all over every bit of their body. Uh, they might be tattooed head to toe. Those folks I'm going to stay away from. I'm not going to give the gospel to them. I will share it with those that are, are better off. And this is what Paul's saying. We do not show partiality to the rich, to the small, to the great. It's for all. So what we also see here is that Paul is not afraid to tell the great. See, it's one thing to tell the small but Paul is standing in front of the great, fearlessly in front of a king, fearlessly in front of governors. He told Felix, repent. And Felix was scared out of his wits because of the power of this gospel that he preached. We've seen in our very day that we live in a cultural moment that when we stand up for the gospel, we may find ourselves imprisoned. They're making laws that say, you can't say sin is sin. It'll be outlawed. What are we going to do then? We're going to stop. We're going to preach the gospel. We live in a culture, I think, that's used a, a pandemic. If you want to call it a pandemic, lots of folks get sick. This isn't a pandemic like the plague. 50% of England died during the plague. This isn't that same sort of thing. This is something they're using to take the freedoms of people away. And we need to be those like Tim Stevens in Canada and James Coates that stood up against it. In our cultural moment, Boot says, it's a time to wake up. Culture is the public manifestation, as I said earlier, and he does, of, reli of the religion of the people. It's our applied beliefs. We as the church are prophets, priests, kings, and queens called to minister to the world. I better be quiet. I don't want them to cancel me. I don't want that maybe they'll put me in jail because we had church that morning. God forbid. Because here's the deal, and it moves to my last point. Safety, health, freedom, and salvation is not a gift of the grace from the state. It is a gift of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only true safety, health, freedom, and salvation in him. Amen? Amen? Right? We need to speak the truth in a society that's lost and dying. No, listen, you don't need to hear a Christian. We'll protect you. Actually, you know, stay home and do this and do that. The state's completely out of their, 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 their level. God, it's God that set up the state and the civil government to do a certain work. Romans 13 is really clear. They're supposed to be God's servant or deacon. They're not supposed to be our provider or our Lord. So the people have to speak up against that. No matter what, persecution comes our way. 
We preach a radically, uh, a radical gospel of transformation no matter what. We preach it to the small and we preach it to the great. We preach it to the powerful and we preach it to the weak. Last point, the Lord of transformation in life. Saying no other things, verse 22 says, than those things that the prophets and Moses said would come. Paul started off with this at the beginning in chapter 26, and now he's ending with this. Saying no other thing than what the prophets and Moses said would come. Here he is speaking to King Agrippa that this little child in Nazareth who appeared to him is the fulfillment and focus of all of Scripture. It reminds me of the day when Jesus uh, rose again from the dead, that very day when there was those two disciples rock, walking on the road to Emmaus. And man, they were upset. They were sad. Their world had come crashing down around them. The one man that they thought was going to deliver them was crucified, dead, and buried. And these two guys were sad. They were beside themselves. They were faithless. And then Jesus comes and walks with them. And their day got a bit better as he walked along. And, and he didn't let on who he was, but he pretended. He's like, why are you boys so sad? What, what's got you so down these days? And they go like, are you living in a cave, brother? Have you not seen what's going on in Palestine? This Jesus was dead and buried, and he was going to be the one. What things? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a mighty prophet in word and deed. Chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. They crucified him. We were hoping that it was going to be he that was going to redeem Israel. Boys, he did. You just didn't know how. It was through death and burial and resurrection. Does it seem a thing too great to believe, Agrippa, that God raises the dead? These boys were in the company of the very resurrected Christ. They go on to see, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early were astonished. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Jesus was only telling this that to them over and over. The Son of Man must be rejected and, and, and persecuted and die, and he'll rise again from the dead. But, but they were faithless. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And this is where I hear Paul speaking right here. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And at the end of that story, Jesus disappears while they have dinner together. And those guys go, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Folks, if you're a Christian, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The scriptures now are open to us, and there are many great and precious promises that are fulfilled and that are being fulfilled, whether it's Genesis 3.15, whether it's Psalm 2 that talks about this king sitting on the holy hill and asking for the nations to be his inheritance, which they are. And how do they become his inheritance? Through the preaching of the power of the gospel that changes people and families and nations to Christ. Psalm 72 promises us, he shall have dominion also from sea to she and from the river to the ends of the earth. And as Stan read this morning, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. I wonder if Jesus is walking to them saying, have you read Genesis 3, 15 where Moses said, have you read where David wrote this? Have you read where the seed of Abraham would come? I just wonder what he was telling them. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And here's the, the chain that cannot be broken. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, 
What kingdom? The very kingdom of God that Jesus was teaching the apostles about to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. And I can tell you that justice is not social justice. It's real judgment. It's real justice. And it comes through his people. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. Jesus described what the kingdom of heaven was like. It's like a little mustard seed, which man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. That's what the church should be in preaching a powerful gospel that can change folks and redeem the world. Let's come up and sing our last song here together. See, this is what happens when I've got a whole week that I don't have to read books for school. I got 10 pages plus. I'm sorry about that. I probably could have said it in a shorter way. <clears throat> but this is what Habakkuk promises. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I know in this song we're going to sing Joy to the World. Uh, Isaac Watts, uh, some say he was looking to the second coming. And listen, we know that when consummation comes, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, everything will come to pass. But I'm afraid we put all of the already till the not yet. When there's a lot of the not yet that, that, that we're still fulfilling day in and day out by the power of the gospel. That very thing I said, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to 21. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things have become new. And we are called to a ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he's committed the word of reconciliation to us. We're responsible to carry that message forth as ambassadors pleading for them to turn. Scripture, Jesus promises us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's a promise. Those are the gates of hell. Gates don't go anywhere. We've got to storm the gates of hell with the message of the gospel that transforms people. The gates of Hades shall not prevail. Let's storm the gates with the power of the message of the gospel to turn people from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to the power of God. Jesus is right now seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. That's part of the promise. And it's part of the mission that we have to carry this glorious gospel to the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. Father, we thank you for the lavish love and for the infinitely great gospel that has saved us, Lord, and that is a message that can radically transform our world, that you might be glorified and that you might change and, 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 and save people, Father. We just thank you for this call personally to carry the message, Lord, to our family, to our friends, and to our neighbors, to be those that will stand up under the pressure of persecution and and being marginalized, that we would be like Paul, unafraid, courageous, because we know, God, you stand by us day in and day out. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.